uh, we will be hearing from Dr. Michael Vinayuga, and uh, we refer to him as Dr. Mike. And we have a lot of guests and a lot of Migrate 28 participants um, listening to us right now. So we want to thank you for taking the time uh, to hear about tonight's presentation. Without any further ado, I do want to introduce Dr. Mike because tonight's presentation is one that we have gotten so many questions and requests for. So Dr. Mike, I know that you are with us. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. How about you? I am good. I'm good. I'm glad and excited to hear about the topic you have in store for us this evening. Of course. And I labeled <laughs> it exercise with an exclamation point and ugh. Because in my experience, so many people, when they look at weight management programs, not just weight loss, but weight management programs, they get caught up in this warp state where they think they need to exercise endlessly. And, you know, if, if you have the wherewithal in your life to be able to exercise as much as you want, whenever you want, then, yeah, wonderful. And if that's what you like doing, that's great. But if you're like most individuals who really look at it as, well, this is one of those necessities. I must do this, but I don't necessarily enjoy it. This is going to be for you. Now, having said all of that, the Migrate 20 program, the exercise requirement in the program is really just about the minimum exercise required. In the program, we talk about you need to have 20 minutes of moderate pace walking five days a week. Okay, That's about as minimum as you can get. It's basically get up, push away from the desk, and take a stroll around here, there, and everywhere. Having said that as well, there are many people on the program who have lost weight with no exercise. And that's an important um, point to make because people who need to lose the largest amount of weight typically have a great deal of pain and inflammation that keeps them from exercising. So the good news is you can lose weight on this program even without the exercise. The even better news is as the weight comes off, as the pressure on the joints diminishes, as the inflammation subsides, you can add the exercise and you can actually improve the pace of weight loss. So having said all of that, the next slide I put in here because only because most people know me as the doctor who does the wellness and weight management seminars. I am an internal medicine specialist. I have a private practice in Ormond Beach, Florida. And the next slide highlights some of the things that I've been responsible for in my life. Um, and yes, there is that clinical instructor in the Department of Medicine at Yale University School of Medicine. And I simply use this slide to highlight the fact that, well, from the medical standpoint, many people already understand my credentials in the field. The issue then becomes, well, who am I to talk about exercise? Because unfortunately, and I know this as a doctor, most doctors are actually a little bit on the heavy side, if not actually obese. It's, it's always for me been a disconnect between they say that the patient needs to lose weight and exercise, and yet they themselves cannot or will not. So having said all of that, the next slide shows a picture of me this past summer juggling a soccer ball. Now, it looks like the ball is completely stationary and it looks like I'm just standing there. But for those of you who understand juggling a soccer ball, I am bouncing that ball alternating between my left thigh, my right thigh, my left thigh, my right thigh. And the pace of that movement can be quite rapid. The goal is to keep the ball bouncing for a minimum of 50 touches, 5-0. So last summer, for this particular picture, I kept the ball up in the air 72 times, 72 touches. And yes, by about the 20, 25th touch, it is quite the aerobic workout, and the speed actually does not diminish at all. So this is my way of establishing some of my credibility for talking about exercise. More specifically, the next few slides, this is what I used to do before I decided I was going to become a doctor. In high school, I ran the 100-meter dash in 11.4 seconds, the 200 in 24.2 seconds, the 400 in 57 seconds. I was also captain of the varsity team, and we finished third in the region of the country where we play 
we finished third the year that I was a senior. The following year, of course, I was now in college, but my younger brother took that same team and they placed third in the national competition. In college, I maintained my physicality through a variety of different races, road races, runs, 5K, 10K. Um, I did place first in the freshman marathon. I also played one season with the Philippine Charity Sweepstakes Office, the PCSO soccer team. So I was actually a paid soccer player at one point in my life. It lasted one season because between travel time and the physical effects of practicing and training and then playing um, got in the way of maintaining good grades. So I had to give that up. The next slide then shows what else I did going through the rest of my training. In medical school, I was the only individual in the history of the school to have won the 100 meter dash as a freshman and all the way through my senior year. Now understand, as a senior, you're basically on call every third night or every other night, depending on the rotation, and there wasn't a lot of time to truly, truly stay in shape. But my habit in medical school was to run nearly every day 10 miles, not because truly I wanted to stay in shape, but because I wanted to deal with stress. Throughout my postgraduate training, I got myself back into soccer playing shape, and then I signed up with the local town's adult soccer league and helped bring that team to never really um, being in competition to finishing first or second for the year. Over the last 15 years, I have been a competitive soccer coach for the local, te uh, the local town, OBSC, stands for Ormond Beach Soccer Club, and in that capacity, I took one of our teams to a third place finish in the state finals. Through the course of these last 15 years, I've also obtained what's called the NSCAA Premier Diploma. That stands for the National Soccer Coaches Association of America Premier Diploma. It is a one-week residential camp by invitation only of people who play and coach soccer. And you basically do everything that you're supposed to be teaching your players. But it also gave me insight into what else goes into the making of an athlete. So all of this is simply by way of highlighting three things. One, in my younger years I was an athlete. I know exercise from that standpoint. Secondly, I learned about the science of exercise when I was in pre-med and med school. And lastly, more recently, I now understand the coaching components of exercise. So. Let's talk about exercise. It is both a noun and a verb. As a noun, it is activity requiring physical effort carried out especially to sustain or improve health and fitness. As a verb, it is you engaging in the physical activity to sustain or improve health and fitness. You typically go take exercise. Now, for the purposes of this talk tonight, I'm going to divide exercise into two broad types. And please, this is not meant to be an exhaustive, all-encompassing discussion of exercise and exercise types, but it is meant to be something that will help people on this program, my grade 28, wanting to lose weight, wanting to keep the weight from coming back, guide you on, based on your goals and your pre-existing conditions as to what you might want to pursue. So the next slide shows the two general types of exercise for this discussion. The first is aerobic, and that's an older term, or nowadays it's known as cardio exercise. And the most common examples of this are jogging, bike riding, swimming is a mixed type of exercise dancing, and most sports include this as well. The second broad category, as shown on the next slide, are the resistance exercises. And most people know this as weight lifting, but it could also be body weight exercises. Nowadays, there's a lot of use of resistance bands. It could be partner or ballroom dancing, again swimming, as I mentioned earlier, and certain other sports. Um, I'm going to stay on this slide for a, a second or two because 
Many people don't quite understand partner or ballroom dancing, especially if there are lifts involved. You and typically it is the male partner doing the lifting. There's a lot of resistance exercise going on. But there's the converse to that. If the female partner is then posing in a particular movement, she has to lock her body into a certain position or posture, and now she's using body weight resistance type exercises. Swimming is both aerobic as well as resistance. It is aerobic in the sense that you get your heart rate up and going for a while and you're breathing quite heavily. But the resistance, of course, comes from the density of water compared to air. And then certain sports, the best example of this being football. Football players are clearly very muscle strong players because the game itself, the sport itself requires that type of development. Now, this is where it gets really, really interesting. Each type of exercise has certain benefits depending on what it is that you need and what it is that you have to begin with. So let's move on to the next slide and we're going to talk about the cardio component first. So if you jog or ride a bike or Zumba classes, just so long as you're not lifting any weights while you're doing the dance, um, these types of exercises improve cardiac and pulmonary capacity, what people commonly refer to as stamina or wind. Most importantly, it improves vascular elasticity, the ability of the vessel wall, the blood vessel wall, to expand and contract in time with the heartbeat. And the reason this is so important is because this actually leads to a lowering of the blood pressure. Now, it's not going to lower the blood pressure by large numbers to make taking medication for blood pressure unnecessary. We're talking about decreasing blood pressure by between 5 and 7 points, maybe a maximum of 10 points. But more importantly, it makes the blood vessel less a rigid tube and more like a soft plastic tube or rubber tube that it was originally designed to be. And then lastly, so far as aerobic or, cardiac, or cardio exercises are concerned, is the component of cognitive enhancement. I have always said that if I needed to work through a particularly thorny problem, that I needed to go out and run and play a hard game of soccer. Partly it was because my subconscious brain would work on the problem while I was concentrating on the game itself. Secondly, and this is just a very me mechanistic way of looking at it, the increased blood flow through the brain as a result of exercise, activated other centers of the brain and allowed things to start functioning more efficiently. So these are the main benefits of aerobic or cardio exercise. If what you're trying to do is finish a road race, a 5K or a 10K, then you need to concentrate on this. If what you're trying to do is last longer in your tennis match, then you need to concentrate on this. If what you have is high blood pressure and you would like better control of your blood pressure, then this is the type of exercise that you need to do. Resistance exercise, on the other hand, lifting weights, body weight exercises, or even um, resistance bands with body weight exercises, clearly improves strength. The muscles get bigger and the ability to lift more and push more and faster improves. But it also improves functional capacity. And what we mean by this, if your job requires for you to be standing up in a slightly extended position and working with your arms at shoulder level or higher, such as, for example, installing cabinets or painting rooms, well, it would do you a lot of good to have exercises that concentrated on developing the, mus the musculature of the lower back, the shoulders, and the arms, because these are the muscles that you use in that particular function. However, a very interesting thing happens when you start lifting weights or do any kind of resistance exercise. It improves glycemic control. 
what this means is your blood sugar all of a sudden starts behaving a lot better than it ever did before. And the improvement lasts a long time. If you went out and ran, that's aerobic or cardio exercise, your metabolic rate goes up for the duration of the run or whatever the activity might be. But within 15 to 20 minutes of stopping that activity, your metabolic rate goes back down again to the basal rate. Not so with resistance exercise. You lift weights and for the next 32 to 36 hours, your metabolic rate is chugging along at a higher rate than before. Your body is burning energy, sugar, and depending on when you did the exercise, you might go through one or two sleep cycles. You're in bed, you're completely asleep, and yet your metabolic rate is higher than it had been before. And this is why it happens. All resistance exercises produce microscopic tears in muscle tissue. The muscle fibers are torn. The body then attempts to re repair the torn muscle fibers. It has to synthesize new protein. It has to put in more fibers. It has to put and build new fibers, hence the increase in the muscle size. But all those metabolic processes burn energy. And just because of the way it works, the repair process does not take place in an hour or two or overnight. It extends over a 30 to 36 hour time span. So if what you have is a need for better control of your sugar, you may want to do more weightlifting and resistance exercises than aerobic exercises. If what you have is high blood pressure and you need a little bit better control of the high blood pressure, what you may want to do is work on your aerobic type exercise. So, moving on to the next slide, I will define exercise according to my experience and I do this with apologies to the American Heart Association because Approximately 20 years ago, the American Heart Association, in an effort to make more people feel that they're getting sufficient exercise, came up with a set of guidelines that basically said, if you vacuum one room, one medium-sized or average-sized room, you would have gotten the equivalent of this much exercise. So training three rooms would give you this much exercise equivalent. If you did one load of laundry, it would give you this much equivalent of exercise. When I first saw those guidelines, I immediately said, this is all wrong. And please don't get me wrong. Cleaning a house is not the easiest thing to do. You do burn calories and it can be quite tiring. But if what I'm trying to do is stay in shape, maintain my stamina, or lift a particular weight at a competition, or I want to win a soccer match, I cannot stay in shape with the exercise equivalent that the American Heart Association put out by cleaning or vacuuming houses and doing laundry. Those things are essential. They are activities that uh, will tire us out, but they don't serve the same function as actual exercise. So from my viewpoint, I define exercise as physical activity outside of the range of the activities of daily living, maintained for 20 to 30 minutes or more, with a sustained increase in heart rate and basal metabolic activity. The reason for that 20 to 30 minutes is very important. Anyone who's exercised to some degree gets a little breathless after some time. Most people who've exercised with any regularity also know that they need to push past that stage of breathlessness and they get what is called the second wind. The second wind actually represents a set of physiologic adaptations by our body. Our bodies shift from burning sugar to burning fat the blood vessels open up, dilate, and blood flow is improved. The stroke volume of the heart, the amount of blood that the heart pumps out per beat increases. The um, vital capacity of the lungs increases. A whole host of physiologic adaptations take place, 
And it is at that point that the benefit of the exercise starts accruing to the individual, not before. So if you're cleaning house, and most of us know this, if you're cleaning house, you pace yourself. You do it at the pace that will get it done, but not one that will you know, have you huffing and puffing at the end of it because it's not really exercise. It's an activity, but it's not exercise. So that brings us now to the question, how do we sum this up? How do we apply this to the individual who's on the program, wants to lose weight? What should you do? And in my usual fashion, I start off by asking you questions again. So what should you do will be determined by what is it that you want to achieve? If you have a blood pressure problem, well, you may want to concentrate a little bit more on aerobic type exercise. If you want better control of your blood sugar, you may want to spend a little bit more time lifting weights. If what you want to do is weight loss alone, then you may want to do some aerobic exercise with a minimal amount of resistance exercise. But if what you want to do is change your body composition, you want to lose weight but you want to gain muscle specifically, then yes, you're going to have to spend more time doing resistance exercise. If you're exercising because you're looking at a particular sport that you'd like to participate in, well, you need to keep that in mind as well. Football players are going to be doing a lot of lifting and short rapid bursts of very forceful activity versus a soccer player. In my day, because I played midfield, I could run forever. I couldn't lift too much, but I could run forever. I could basically outrun anyone just because that's the way I was trained. Also very important to consider your starting point. If you're out of shape, if you've never really exercised before, or if your weight is causing so much pain and disability and inflammation, Understand, simply walking around for 20 minutes five times a week, it's going to be a major milestone. And that may be about as good as it gets for a while. On the other hand, if you're already moderately fit and you're doing certain activities, you may want to start setting goals. I'm going to cut a few seconds off this particular run. I'm going to extend my run. I'm going to add exercises to the run. Or if you're already a competitive athlete, and here's a very important consideration, you need to mix it up. If you've always run, if you've spent the last 40 some years of your life running, you can knock out a 5K, a 10K run with almost no <laughs> effort on your part because your muscles and your entire nervous system are so well trained to handling the run. If you mix it up a little bit, you start doing a slightly different movement. You run slightly differently. You add a hip pack with weights, or you go into a different type of exercise altogether. Different muscles will be called into play, and that will increase the burn rate. And then lastly, you have to consider age. What I could do in my 20s and what I can reasonably do in my 40s and 60s are very different things. And it's most important to keep things that way. Don't be caught into the mindset that I must do this because I could do this 40 years ago. Well, that was great. That was 40 years ago. Because lung, lung capacity diminishes even if you do nothing. Aging will do that. Heart pumping capacity will decline as well. The speed at which a muscle can contract and develop force declines with age, unfortunately or not, because after all, aging is a good thing to have. You're still alive, but different things will happen, and your, your targets and your goals should change as well. So lastly, one of the things I want people to consider is you may want to change your perception of what constitutes exercise. So when I was in my late teens and early 20s, running and running hard and running fast and playing competitive soccer was all kinds of good. But it may be that in my 50s, a different kind of exercise is necessary. And I've mentioned before, partner or ballroom dancing is actually a mixed aerobic and resistance exercise. Yoga, Tai Chi, and similar type activities 
improve flexibility and because of holding a particular stance for some length of time, they actually constitute body weight resistance exercise. If you like walking but it's getting old and getting boring, I have a suggestion. Sign up for walking tours. It could be the local city hall, it could be a historic building, it could be a wildlife tour. Whatever the case may be, sign up for walking tours. Number one, the time's going to pass, you're not going to notice it because you're going to be entertained. Number two, these tours typically are a little fast-paced and you will get your exercise. Number three, and this is always good, you'll learn new things and that's always a good thing. So having said all of that, I'm going to bring this back full circle and talk about a personal perspective. When I was growing up, this was back 50 some years ago in the Philippines, we did not have a weight room at the local high school. So we had to improvise and I tell the story about the bull, the stallion and the front gate. When I was in middle school and first year high school, because we lived in a subdivision that had a lot of open space that was used for grazing animals. One of them was a bull, one of them was a stallion. We would taunt the bull. And when we were not fast enough yet, we had to learn to be quick so the bull could not hurt us. So we learned quickness of movements and rapid and uh, changes of direction. When we could regularly outrun the bull and that was no longer challenging, we then started to taunt the stallion. Now, of course, we never could outrun the horse. But for us, the key was how long a distance, how many seconds, how many feet can we run before the horse overtakes us. And of course, as we got older, that got progressively longer. And then the story of the front gate. The front gate of my house had a four and a half high steel gate. And my brother and I, as we approached our senior year in high school, developed enough muscle strength that we could, from a standing start, jump and land on top of the gate. Now, that did not happen overnight and that did not happen in one year. There were a lot of banged knees and scraped shins, but we improvised. You need to evolve with your age. I used to run a lot and then I went into highly competitive sports like soccer. When I couldn't quite sustain that anymore, I went into volleyball. Still a team sport, still quite aerobic, but less running than before then it evolved to dancing. You need to stay current. Resistance bands are probably the single best innovation to fitness that I have seen in the last 20 years. With a budget of less than $50, you can buy yourself a set of resistance bands. They will travel with you very easily because you can store them in your luggage. It takes up next to no space. All you need is a door and about five to seven feet in front of that door and you'll be fine. You also, I also use supplements as needed. Restorix, our detox product, I use specifically now to pull lactic acid out of me faster than what my body can handle. And the reason for this is because I don't have to suffer the muscle soreness that working out used to bring. Not anymore. Not if I use my Restorix. I use the Omega-Q and the Accelerate specifically because the components in these two products are needed by the body for repair processes. So rather than risk working out and things not being repaired quickly enough because of a lack of healthy fats or B12, I take the supplements. And lastly, I use the optimal vitamins and minerals to plug up any nutritional holes in my particular situation. So having said all of that, at the end of the day, Find an exercise that you enjoy doing, doesn't have to be what is conventional exercise. Keep it fresh, make it fun, never stop because exercise and building some muscle truly is the fountain of youth. I love this presentation, Dr. Mike, and um, as, as I want to thank you for this because people, people ask all the time, I'm feeling better, I didn't want to exercise going into this but I'm starting to feel so good, what should I do, where should I start, what does this mean? And then there are other people, 
um, that were very active at one point in their lives, and it could be an injury or whatever happens, kind of life, but as you, you discussed earlier, and they, and they want to get back to it, but maybe they haven't felt like it until they started feeling good um, and doing all of this. But what I wanted to share with everyone, and uh, just like Dr. Mike had mixed emotions about pictures of himself, I'm putting myself out there because I called Dr. Mike and I said, Dr. Mike, I really want to take this seriously. I really want to slim down. I used to be athletic. I am not anymore. I'm hoping that there are some muscles left in there, but I don't want to lift weight. I really want to do this strictly for weight loss. So here are the results of Dr. Mike coaching me through my grade 28 over an eight-week series. And this is what starting exercise can do, really. All this was was consistent cardio. It, nothing crazy. I didn't lift a single weight. I'm embarrassed to tell you I did not do one single sit-up. And the fact that my stomach went from the second picture at the top, and I actually was sucking it in in the before picture because I was so embarrassed how, <laughs> how big my lower belly was. But down there at the bottom, to have a flat stomach, I never dreamed that would happen again. Um, and so I'm just going to tell everybody, I followed the plan. And I followed it to a T. And it was difficult for me, not because the products didn't work, but because of my horrendous habits. So I took it one day at a time. I would, um, I, I would go from breakfast to lunch without, you know, looking for something ridiculous to eat. And then I would go from lunch to the afternoon and from the afternoon through dinner and dinner through night. And after about four or five days, um, I was fine. I was set free. But the same was with the exercise. Every day when I started moving, I wanted to move more. And so it went from power walking to Dr. Mike said, you need to listen to some awesome music and you need to pick a song and just try to run through that song. And I thought, oh my gosh. And I did. And um, then it came to doing kind of chasseing down the side like I would walk. And then I might jog to a song. Then I kind of do some side steps on one side and side steps to the other side. I'm sure people thought I was nuts. But it was nothing crazy, <laughs> nothing radical. I wasn't flipping tire tractors of tractor tires around in the yard like you see these people do with this extreme exercise stuff. I'm not against that. It, that just wasn't me. And I'm telling you, if it worked for me, it will work for you. And um, Dr. Mike, I want to thank you for coaching me through that because yeah. now our whole family is more active. You're and welcome. Now, yeah, I am doing the resistance <laughs> bands. I'm doing very high reps, so very low weight to get even more definition. And all of a sudden, getting fit is fun. It's not a chore. And that's what I want to tell all of you, um, is being coached by someone with this, with this knowledge in our whole health panel, but getting me through this, I just wanted to share that with you guys, that you know, I wasn't a gym rat at all. I was just getting outside 25 to 30 minutes of making myself sweat. That was my gauge. How much did I sweat today? I mean, that's how badly I dumbed it down. So with all that being said, and Dr. Mike, I don't know if you want to say anything. I was, you, you had mentioned something at the end of my presentation, and that resonated with me because I first looked at this program following a sports injury. Um, all those years of being very, very physical, I was coaching high school soccer at that time. And in the span of one year, between the spring and the fall, I basically had two injuries that made playing and burning calories at the rate that I used to um, next to impossible. And even though I had cut back on eating and I was doing everything that I knew as a doctor and as, a, as an athlete, nothing was coming off. And when I saw this program, I instituted the program, and <laughs> here we go. Life is so much better. Now, the interesting thing is, once I got, and understand, I did not have to lose a lot of weight. I only gained 15 pounds, and people think that that's, you know, not quite a good story. But I have diabetes on both sides of my family. And when you gain 15 pounds in the span of about nine months, it's essentially somebody opened the doors wide open to diabetes coming into my life. 
and I did not want for that to happen. So I got the weight off, and the most interesting thing is only 15 pounds of weight coming off allowed me to start exercising again because this picture, again, was summer of last year, four years after my injuries. And yes, I'm back in my soccer gear, and I'm at full stretch to deliver a what's called an instep kick. It's the type of kick that you either drive a ball into the goal with, or if you're looking to serve the ball 35 to 50 yards down the field. I had thought I was no longer going to be able to do that because of any number of different things. So now as a coach, I can sit here and say, well, you know, uh, technically speaking, I can point out a few things that could be improved upon, but hey. We won't touch on that tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I just want to thank you so much for sharing this with us. And I want to thank everyone who joined us tonight. And um, like we said, exercise isn't required. But let me tell you, and I'm speaking from the heart, the hardest thing I had to do was get moving. But once I got moving, it's amazing what it did for every aspect of my life. Like you said, I wasn't forgetting things as much. I had my act together during the day. I felt amazing. All of the supplements that I was taking, everything included, and um, now we're an active family, and um, I want that for everyone, even if it's just taking the stairs tomorrow when you get to work or parking a little farther away from um, you know, the front parking space at whatever store you're going into. And just walking around the block, we have one woman who has lost over 100 pounds um, who said she started counting mailboxes. And she said, I walked three mailboxes today. For her, that was mm. monumental when she first got started. Then she says, I'm going to work my way up to 10. And then before we knew it, she walked around the block. And the list goes on and on. So we want these stories. We want to hear from you. Send us your before and after photos. Go to the Migrate 28 Facebook page and like us. We update it daily. Keep in touch with your coaches. Email us your stories, even if it's just, hey, I learned to like Brussels sprouts, or I can't believe I'm eating vegetables every day, or um, I you know, didn't take my whatever it was one day, and boy, did I feel it. And the next day, I realized these really are making a difference in my life. Whatever it is, we want to share these with people because you never know what your story, your photo, your uh, recipe, what it's going to do for someone else. And we will see you next week. And Dr. Mike, thank you so much, so, so much for joining us. And I cannot wait to see you at the WOW event um, down in Florida. See you then.